Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this message. It's because of people like you that we are able to continue to reach with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. If you would like to give to our efforts or to Set Free Missions, visit setfree.cc slash give. Feel free to check out other great messages like this one on our website, setfree.cc, our Church Center app, or our Vimeo channel. If there's anything we can do to serve you, please feel free to contact us at 864-269-3620 or at hello at setfree.cc. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Now for the message. Enjoy. Go with me over to Psalms chapter 63. Y'all sit where you want to. I love you anyway. I do. Psalm 63, Barbara's back on Wednesday nights. Psalm 63, we're going to read this psalm, then we're going to look into the background of it a little bit. Now, I, I, I've had one or two complaints that said that Pastor Caleb and I are teaching too deep on Wednesday nights. Uh, so... Um, I don't mean to bore you with it being more like a clash than, than me exciting you, preaching to you, but um, I just, I, I, I love to teach, and I love to exegete the scriptures, and that's okay. Is that okay to just exegete deep on down? I, I, it's just, my mindset is if we don't ever dig deep, how do we learn? Yeah, how do we learn? How do we learn? And so anyway, Psalms chapter 63, I've had several people I've heard that from, but we love them all. Psalm 63, we're going to read it. David said, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. What am I, what am I longing for? Look what he says. To see your power and your glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy love and kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate upon thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I trust. My soul followeth hard after you. Your right hand upholdeth me. Those are some powerful words. Now, let's look at when David wrote this, and then we'll come back and, and dissect some of this. David wrote this. Go me over into 1 Samuel chapter 23. David is on the run. And... Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 23, of course, Saul is hot after him. And David hears, um, let me see where I want to be. Let me see. I should have marked my beginning place. Verse 1, David hears that the Philistines are attacking and robbing and, and, and vandalizing Kayla. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Kayla, and they rob the threshing floors. Now remember, David wrote the psalm that we just read during this time, okay? That's what we're talking about. It says, uh, they're robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite the Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Kayla. David's men said unto him, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then shall, if we come to Caleb against the armies of the Philistines? They, they was in fear. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go to Caleb, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. And David and his men went to Caleb and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Caleb. He just did a good work. And it came to pass when Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Caleb that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Caleb. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into my hand, for he is shut in. He's entered into a town that has gates and bars. I got him hemmed up. I'm going to get him. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Caleb to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said unto Abathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. 
Y'all know what the ephod is? I'm not going into that. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Caleb to destroy the city for my sake. And he asked God a question. Will the men of Caleb deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down? As your servant has heard, O Lord God of Israel, I beseech you, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Caleb deliver me into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver you. Hmm. David, he's trying to help. He heard that the Philistines were robbing Caleb. He goes in to help, and he asks God, God, shall I go? And in verse 4, God said, go, I'll deliver them to you. And then you get down to verse 7, and it was told Saul. And Saul said, I got him. He's in a town that's got gates and, and uh, bars. He's, he's in a walled city. David's in a vulnerable spot. He's obeying God, but he's in a vulnerable spot. Because of his obedience, it has put him in a vulnerable spot. And Saul is watching. Don't you know that the devil's always looking to catch you in a weak spot? Even in your obedience, if he can find a, a weak spot on you, he's going to say, I got him. I got him right there in that weak spot. And then, you know, you, you could say verses 11 through 12 when... when uh, God had told David, go down and do this. And then David says, God, is Saul going to come in after me? And God said, yep. Well, God, are these people going to hand me over to him? Yep. David must have been thinking, well, God, you told me to come. You set me up for this. Why am I in this trouble when I'm obeying you? You ever felt like you were doing the right thing? And the more you did the right thing, everything went wrong? That's, that's kind of where David was. And, and boy, I mean, it would be real easy to get bitter at God and say, God, why do you do this to me? It wasn't God, it was Saul. Saul is the one that hated him. Saul is the one that was coming in after him. God, why do you do this to me? It's not always God. There's a devil that hates you. There's a devil that hates you, and he will use every opportunity, even in your obedience, he will use every opportunity to get at you. And, and, and then, you know, I'm not, you know, here's what, here's what you can never be surprised at. God will, the men of Kayla hand me over? Or are they going to rat me out? And God said, yes, sir, they're going to rat you out. Of course, he got up and left, right? But here's what I want you to notice. You can be in obedience, and you can be doing the will of God, and trouble come on you, and don't ever be surprised. David had done these inhabitants of Cala a great favor. He saved their city, saved their children. And when it comes down to it's either us or them, they ratted him out. Don't ever, don't ever be surprised when the one that you've loved the most You've helped the most. The one that you've done the most for is the very one that turns on you. And they'll always do it like these inhabitants of Caleb. If, if they hadn't have turned David over, Saul would have came in and, and killed all of them if they were trying to hide him. So they look at this, well, David, you did us a favor, but now it's, it's us or you, so you got to go, buddy. They were going to turn him over, so David gets out of town, and they don't catch him. And then it says here in that chapter, it says that David went up to the mountains, he was hiding. His 600 men scattered. They went in all different directions. And David's got one or two with him, and he goes up and he's hiding. While he's up in the mountain hiding, he writes Psalm 63. Again, put this in perspective. David only did what God told him to do. David did the right thing. He went in and destroyed the enemies of God. I mean, yeah, destroyed the enemies of God. And then Saul, his enemy, got after him. There's another truth there. The more damage you do at the devil, expect him to come after you. Let me say that again. There's a revelation there. When you hurt him, get ready. Well, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm going to coast and go easy. Well, you can't do that because he'll eat you up. 
I mean, I, I hate, I, you know, I don't want to burst your bubble, but here's the fact of the matter. When you got saved, it was on. <laughs> and you need to realize from the time you got saved, hell broke loose on your life, and it's a war whether you want to be in war or not. Well, I'm a peace, peaceable, peace-loving person, Pastor. That's all right. Your enemy's not. And so David, David could have really gotten sideways right here and been asking God, why? I'm, I just did what you told me, and it got me in a bad spot, and Saul's coming in on me. And, and so his, his men have to disband. They got out of town quick. They didn't leave as a group, and they just scattered. And David's off up in the mountains by himself and maybe a handful of men with him. And you will always see what a person's made out of when they're under that kind of stress and you hear what comes out of their mouth. Because anybody can put up a front when everything's going easy. Anybody can glory to God, hallelujah, when all the bills are paid and everything's back good and no trouble in the family. And no sick. But when the pressure comes on, you'll really see what comes up out of their mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when the pressure comes on, what's in their spirit is what will come out of their mouth. I know because a lot of times the wrong things comes out of my mouth when I get under pressure. I'm asking God to help me, and you are too. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so it's under that condition. He, he did the, the right thing. He barely got out by the skin of his teeth doing the right thing. Saving the, the inhabitants of Caleb, and then they didn't even appreciate him. They turned, they're gonna turn him over. The more I done for them, the less they loved me. Hey, I'm gonna say that again. Have you ever just really just went out of your way <laughs> and bailed somebody out time and time again, only to have them stick you in the back when you really wasn't expecting? Well, welcome to this big old blue planet. That's the way it works, right? That's the way it works. But watch what come up out of David. We're going to go back. We're going to dissect now that psalm that we read. I want, I want to take you deep into this psalm. And I got, about, I got about 35, 40 minutes. We're going to dig into it deep. Um, Y'all get tired of a Bible class and you want me to entertain you. And I, Caleb, Caleb's an evangelist. He's got, he, can, he can huckle buckle you every Wednesday night if that's what you want. But uh, I... I I love to study the Word of God. Caleb loves to study the Word of God. We've purposed that this night, as this setting is different, we're going to dissect the Word of God. I, I, when I get into Scripture, I like to kick over every rock because you don't ever know what's under that next rock. These little tidbits and little juices. Watch this right here. Psalms chapter 63. Notice in the first verse, he, he uses the word God two times. He said, Oh God, Thou art my God. Right off the bat, look what he says. Oh God, thou art my God. The first word God, he said, oh God. He, he used the word, the plurality of God. Oh God, the plurality of God. He, he's using the polarity in the Hebrew says, oh God, the polarity of majest, majest, majesty. A polarity of majesty. He's speaking of the greatness, the vastness, the complete Godhead. We know God is a triune God. He's a trinity. He's speaking of the fact that God is, is great and vast and there's a, there's a polarity of God's presence and God's spirit. And he says, uh, uh, he says, oh God, oh that triune God, that great God, that vast God that, that sits on a throne in the heaven and yet he fills the earth with his spirit, and yet he lives in me, yet he's Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that God, that all that God, it's the same word that he used in Genesis in the beginning, God. That's the Trinity word, plurality. And when, then he said, and God said, let us make man after our image. That's the polarity of the Godhead. So he starts out by calling on the Godhead. Oh, God. Then he says, thou art my God. He changed the word there. He went from God of plurality and majesty, majesty to he went to, you are my God. It's in a singular form. And he said, you are my God. And what he actually said in the Hebrew is, I have a personal experience with God. Now we're not talking about how big God is and all that. He, he's a, we're using a singular form. He, oh God, you're my God. 
And in Hebrew, he's saying this. He's saying, my personal God is a mighty God. My personal God has shown himself compassionate in my life. My God is jealous over me. My personal God is great. My God that I'm in relationship with is alive, and he's, he's living. He's alive, living, compassionate, mighty God. I, I, you, know, you know what he's doing? He's in trouble now. He's running from Saul. He's stung. He's done the right thing, and yet the sting of an enemy is after him. And he, he says, oh, God, my God. What he's doing is he's remembering at this point, this low place in his life, he is remembering who God is and who God has been and what God has done in his life. He takes it from the big, impersonal, this is the God of the universe. He takes it back down to, this is the God that's moved in my life. It's the same, it's the same word over in Ezekiel when it says, and the hand of the Lord came upon Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon Ezekiel. What he's saying is, I know that God, there's a polarity of God, but I've had him put his hand on me. I've experienced him personally. And that's what I need right now when I'm hiding in these mountains for my life. I need that. Per God, I need you to put your hand on me personally. When you're backed into a corner, the best thing you can do is just what he did. Start remembering what God. See, we have a tendency to just look at the current circumstances. And, you know, God can have done miracle after miracle after miracle for us. And if we're not careful, all we'll focus on is the problem, today's problem. And we will beat ourselves down and act like we ain't got no victory, ain't never had no victory when God's done gave you a whole lifetime of miracles. Y'all know my wife, she's, she was going to be here tonight, but we got the little grandson and he fell asleep at 6 o'clock. And you don't wake up no kid that's been playing all day. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, but, you know, y'all know that she just went through several weeks with that COVID here a month or so back. She was bad sick, and she was getting where she was trying. It's, I thought time or two, I was going to have to take her to the emergency room. She was having trouble breathing, and, uh, and, uh, and I got to thinking about it one day, and I said, no, I am not going to let this fear get in my family and in my house. I know what God, and I started talking about this. God, I know you put your hand on me before. I know you healed me and brought me back from a deathbed, and you ain't going to let my wife get sick and die. And I started telling God, oh, God, you my God. I know what you can do. Now watch this. Look what David says. He says, oh, God, thou art my God. Early will I seek you. Get your mind straight first time, first part of the day. I told uh, uh, Thomas and I was talking for church. He's making fun of me. I had a cup of coffee. He said, what number is that today? And I told him, right around, around about my sixth cup of coffee. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I told him, I said, Thomas, I can't think of starting out a day in the morning without a Bible and a cup of coffee and, a, and my back porch and me and G. Early will I... I I don't know about y'all, but if I don't get my mind sanctified first thing in the morning, I'm held to deal with all day. Can I be honest? I got I to gotta capture myself in the morning and, and a Bible and a cup of coffee will do it for Steve. I don't know what it takes for you. The Bible's got to be a part of it. He says, he says uh, oh God, my God, early will I seek you. My soul is thirsty for you and my flesh is longing for you in a dry and a thirsty land. Look what he says he's longing for. Notice, it, notice that um, in a thirsty land where no water is, semicolon. Verse 2 is a continu continuation of the thought. Here's what he's longing for. Y'all, this is wonderful right here. To see your power and your glory. So as I have seen you in the sanctuary, he said, I want to see your power. And I'm up here hiding for my life. I'm in a mess. But I remember being in church and I seen your power and I seen your glory. Now, let me take these words apart. Listen to this. Tell me, when I read you these words, power and glory in the Hebrew, tell me that David wasn't in some kind of Pentecostal spirit-filled church. You know, say, I don't know, you know, I don't know about all that. David is the one when they brought the ark back that danced his clothes off. He danced with all his might, shouted with all his strength. David, that David. 
David said, I'm in a mess right now, but I am, my flesh wants to see your power and glory like I'm used to seeing it in church. I started preaching on the Holy Ghost last Sunday. I'm going to stay on that subject for a while because I want us to get back to the place to where the anointing of God is ridiculous in this house on Sunday. That's what I want to see. But watch these two words. He said, I, I, I got to see your power and your glory. Watch this. I got to see your power, the power I've seen in the sanctuary. Here's what it means. Power means this. Listen, loud, strong, bold force of majestic praise that results in the power being manifested. I'm used to seeing you in church, God, where it's loud and the praise is strong and it's bold and it's forceful and, and it's such a majestic praise that the power of God manifests on the praise that's coming out of people's mouths. That's why the devil don't want us to praise God on Sundays. When praises go up, glory comes down. You got you, In your spirit, when you praise God, you're producing glory and releasing it. He said, I long to see your power, that loud, strong, glory, man, that power manifest in praise. And I long to see your glory. Glory simply means this, your honor and and your glorious presence in abundance. Give me a church where the glorious presence of God is in abundance. And it uses the word majesty. I mean, have you ever been in a church service where God showed up so strong you could tell you was in the presence of a king? He said, I'm longing for that, God. I'm up here, I'm stuck up here hiding for my life. But if I could just get in church... Pray to God set free would be the kind of place where people would say, if I can just get over there to church, I'll be all right. I long to, to see you in your power and your glory. As I have seen in the sanctuary, they handled the heat and David didn't go to no dead church. No. When David went to church, I think I, I just got a feeling of David being there, if they was dead with their praise and worship, he'd stir it up. Yeah. Uh, you know why I love David so much? Go back and study. I'm off my stage, but go back and study uh, Solomon. David said that for Solomon. Go back and study. David created all these instruments and music and had on staff a choir and praise teams and musicians, had, had the whole tribe of Levi, had them on staff. And, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when they went into the temple of God, constantly there was worship and praise and anointing stirred. You couldn't walk into that church house without bumping head on into a seven-day already praise service. I wonder what would happen in here if seven days a week Worship and praise and honor and majesty was being released. You wouldn't have to walk in here and we wouldn't have to prime this church for 20, 30 minutes to get you to open up. Amen. I have been criticized in the past because I am a musician and, and did that for years. And I've been criticized in the past that my attention seems to be more on the praise and worship than any other ministry. And I try not to be and I put good people and Pastor Caleb's great at administrating different ministries, but I'm going to tell you what I have, I, what I, to me personally, I'm going to tell you something. One of the most important ministries in the church is your praise and worship because that's when the anointing of God comes in, and if the anointing of God don't show up, you ain't got nothing anyway. Of course our kids are important. I'm not taking away from that. He said, I, 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 I have a... I've longed to see your power and your glory as I've seen you in the sanctuary. Then he says, because your love and kindness is better than life. Think about that. My lips shall praise you. And, and the way that reads, that way that reads in, and because your love and kindness is better than life, what he's actually saying is, you've been kinder to me than my life has deserved. You've been better to me than what I've deserved. And because you've been better to me than what I've deserved, I'm going to praise you, God. I will, I will bless you while I live. Tell me you're going to fool with David. David's going to praise God, church. I'm going to bless you while I'm alive. I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Lord, have mercy. 
I skipped over something. I've got to go back up, y'all. I'm getting ahead of myself. Watch. Go back to verse 2. He said, I want to see your power. Remember what we talked about, your majesty. I, I want to see your power. I want to see your glory. But look, look what he says. He said, I want to see it. Look in verse 2. I want to see your power as I have seen in the sanctuary. Okay, let me, let me rebuild that verse again. I got ahead of myself. I want to see your power. I want to see your loud, strong, bold, forceful praise that manifests the power of God. I want to see it as I have seen it. Two different words. I want to see it. And when he said, I want to see it in the Hebrew, this is what he said. I want to feel and experience, and I want your spirit to cause me to enjoy and be fully aware of your presence. I, think about, I, want, I want to see it. I want to feel you, God. I want to experience you, God. I want to enjoy you, God. I come to church, I want to experience God. I, I, you know, I live by the Word. I don't live off of feelings. We don't live off of feelings. But I'm going to tell you something. I want to feel Him when I come to church. And I want to enjoy Him. What's wrong with enjoying church? People enjoy baseball games. People enjoy football games. People enjoy sports. They enjoy music. They enjoy all kind of crazy stuff. I, I was talking with a pastor friend of mine today, and he was up in Illinois sitting in a tree talking about he's having the time of his life. He's been out there since 4 o'clock in the morning with a gun in his hand waiting on Bambi to come by. I would not enjoy that. I don't camp in tents, and I don't climb up in trees to shoot deer. But I do enjoy coming to church. And if you ever get to the place where you're not excited, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let me go into the house of the Lord. If you ever get to the place to where it's, it's, a, it's a problem for you, you need to get on your knees and say, God, what's wrong with me? Now, there's some churches around that would be a problem for me to go to, but not this one. Y'all know how to worship God in this church. He said, he said, he said I want to see you. I, I, I want to feel you and experience you and enjoy you. Watch this now. Just like I have seen you in the sanctuary. This is a different word. I want to experience you and feel you like I have seen you. Here's what he said. In the sanctuary I've seen you. I have looked. Listen to this. This is so good. This is how our church services ought to be, y'all. This is a pattern for our church services. He said, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I have looked and gazed in amazement at the sight of your divine presence. That ought to excite you. I want to, I want to be in some church services where the anointing is so strong. Just like the Hebrew word there says, I want to look and gaze in amazement at the sight of God's divine prayer. I want to see God do some things where we just, we just go, wow. <laughs> just be amazed. That I want to get in the car to go home and say, I can't even get my mind wrapped around what God just did by His Spirit today. Are you calling for fanaticism, fanaticism, Steve? No, I'm not calling for ignorance because I'll call you down in a minute if you're ignorant. That's just as rude, crude as I know how to say it. Now, I won't put up with no foolishness, but I am calling for where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and I think we need to let the Spirit of God have His way. Amen. Then he goes on down, he says some things here. He says uh, in verse 4, Thus I'll bless you while I... While I live, I'll lift up my hands. You know, that verse 2 has got a lot in it, don't it? I can't get off that verse 2. Think about what I just taught you. He's talking about, I want to see your power, and I want to see your glory. And, and I want to see it. I want to feel it, experience it, just like I've seen it. I want to be in amazed, amazed at it. And then he says, my soul. Now watch, uh, watch verse 5. Verse 5, now he's hiding. He's still, can, can you think about even you hiding from Saul, and that's even your, in your heart to have that desire? You're hiding from Saul, and all you can think about is, I want to get in God's presence. Shouldn't that be how we are? Shouldn't it just be every day when we got a problem? I just, I, if I can just get in church, if I can just get in God's presence. Have you ever noticed when you come to church, you might have a major problem in your life, in your family, whatever, and you get to church, and the worship starts, and the Spirit of God begins to move, and that problem don't bother you while you're in God's presence. Who's ever noticed that? Yeah. Uh, Elder Therese, you remember Hayes Riddle. I went off with Hayes Riddle one night. He, he had, had surgery on his foot. He could barely step up to the pulpit to preach. And he was preaching, 
and the Holy Ghost got on that man, and he got to jumping up and down and dancing and running back and forth across the platform, and he preached like that for about 15 minutes, and he realized what he was doing. He looked down at that bandaged foot, and he said, well, my foot ain't hurting me right now. <laughs> I had to ride back with him in the car. We got in the car, and he, he always called me Bo. He said, oh, Bo, my foot's about to kill me. I said, no wonder you're jumping up and down on him while you're speaking. David knew I just got to get in the presence of God. Amen. I got to get in the presence of God. It says, uh, then in verse 5, he said, My soul shall be satisfied. This is an interesting verse, too. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Well, let's look at that marrow and fat. Of course, marrow is the, is the uh, innermost part of your being. Marrow is the little jail stuff that's in your bones, that creates the blood cells. If you want to say your, your, your most innermost part is the marrow in your bones. He said, I'm going to be satisfied with marrow. There's a great discretion here. Uh, 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 not the word discretion. There's a great dissent here on whether or not he was talking about I'm going to eat the marrow or something else because, you know, Jews wouldn't eat blood, but there's some scriptures that kind of lean toward they would touch it in certain but I don't even think that's what he's talking about. Go with me just a minute. He said, he said, um, he said, my soul will be satisfied with marrow. Now he, he's talking about, I just want to get in God's presence. I'm in this great place of warfare in my life. But I, I'm remembering what it's like to be in church. I'm remembering what it's like for your majesty and your power to show up. And he says, my soul will be satisfied with marrow. Let me tell you what I think he's talking about. Hold your hand right there and go with me over to Hebrews chapter 4. Y'all know this verse of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse uh, somewhere in there. Let me see. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Yeah. Watch this. Here's what he's saying. I'm going to get it on. Uh, this is so good, y'all. You got to go with me. Just to stay focused and go with me here just a minute. He said, for the, Paul said, for the word of God it's quick and powerful. It's alive. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. The soul and the spirit aren't the same thing if you can divide them separately. He, watch this. Then the Word of God will also divide the joints and the marrow. And is a discerner of the intents of the heart. He said, this word can work on you and cut on you so deep that it can get past your joints and down into the inside of your bones. Jeremiah said, it feels like fire shut up in my bones. The Word can get down in the marrow on the inside of you. David said, I want to get in a good Holy Ghost service God where they're praising where your glory is manifest, and I want a good anointed word that's going to get all the way down inside of me, and my soul will be satisfied down to the marrow with that good word. I don't know about you, but I have heard men preach the word of God before and went home, and I was just it, like I just had a seven course meal. I was satisfied, all every part of me was satisfied. I was laying down to go to sleep, grinning, because that word was so good. If you've never had that experience, you need to press in and get that experience to work. Word, that word satisfies you to your innermost being. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're not living that way with the Word of God satisfying you to the deepest part of you, you will eventually get in trouble in your life. It, oh, how am I going to get like that, Brother Steve? Take your Bible and read it. It's quick and powerful until it comes alive and jumps up off the page and gets down on the inside of you to where you can't think nothing except that. And watch this now. Go back over to Psalms. David said, I'm back in Psalms. David said, uh, David said in 63, he said, My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. Well, I ain't happy when I'm fat. But watch this. Uh, I'm going to read you a scripture in Psalms 36 and 8. Psalms 36 and 8. He's talking about the children of God. He says, They shall be abundantly satisfied. With, oh, this is an interesting phrase, with the fatness of your house. And you will make them drink of the rivers of thy pleasures. 
You'll make them drink of the river of your pleasure. They'll be satisfied with fatness of your house. I'll be satisfied, my soul will be satisfied as with marrow and the fatness of God's health. You'll make them drink of the rivers of pleasure. The fatness he's talking about here is the blessing of God that's on the house of God. He'll bless them out of Zion. He's talking about, I will put a word in you, and when you come to church, you're going to get blessed so much that you ain't going to want nothing else except what you get in the church. Let me tell you something. I, I've, most, a lot of us have. I lived 10 years of addiction. I lived... Um, eight to nine years on the road with a rock band. I tried everything. I've done everything. You can't name it. I didn't do it. But I'm going to tell you what I have found out. I wouldn't give up what I got right now down in my bones to go back to get into none of that. Because none of that never really satisfied. But boy, when the Spirit of God came on the inside of me, I'm telling you, it's been on since then. I, 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 my soul is satisfied with marrow, what's down on the inside of my bones. And I'm, I'm happy with the fatness of God's house. Sometimes I sit and think about what God's done in different people's lives and over the years. And sometimes I'll leave here on a Sunday service when, when things have really been juking and jiving and God's really been moved. And I'll be sitting around the house on Sunday afternoon grinning going, boy, that's good, God. You showed out today. You ever been like that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Donna was home. It was a Monday morning here a few weeks back, and we'd had an explosion here. And I sat on the porch, Donna come out, and I was grinning. She said, what you grinning at? And I said, I'm just grinning by how God showed out yesterday. Boy, God showed out yesterday. It's down in my marrow. I'm just so happy. I'm telling y'all, I'm, I'm happy to be saved. Are you happy to be saved? I'm, I'm getting older now, but I'm happy to still be called of God at my age and preaching and teaching. I'm just happy for God. Give him a praise right now if you're happy that you're saved. My goodness. I'm happy about it. I'm excited about it. Watch now. We're not quite through, and i got a few more minutes. What, we're going we're gonna to dig on down in this song. He said, my soul, verse 5, I'm satisfied with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Okay, look at verse 6. When I remember you upon my bed, the Hebrew is when I begin to reflect on you, God, on my bed. He didn't, lay, he didn't lay down at night and rehearse his trouble. He didn't lay down and worry. Let me tell you something. When you lay down at night, put your mind on God. Fall asleep with God. You know what I do a lot of times? It just it tell you it just drives my wife insane. Half the time she'll get up and go to another bedroom. But I, I like to do this. I like to lay down and I'll get on my little cell phone and I'll pull up the book of Psalms or the book of Hebrews or something. And I lay it in the bed between me and Donna. I cut it on. I fall asleep listening to it. I'm not going to go to bed worried about yesterday's problems. I'm going to go to bed listening to tomorrow's promises if I can. Donna will either get up and leave and she'll say, can you turn that down? And I'll say, no, I can't hear it. I'm deaf. He said, he said in his bed, when I, when I remember you on my bed, when I begin to reflect on you, did, hey, slow down long enough to think about God. Slow your mind down long enough to reflect on God. He can handle it. He's got you. He didn't start a work in you, not to finish it. <laughs> then he said, then it gets good right here. He, says, he said, I remember you on my bed. And I will meditate on you in the night watches. I'll meditate on you in the night watches. Listen, there is a great truth to, to meditation in the Lord. I know there's these goofy religions where they hum and meditate and do all kinds of stuff. Sit with their legs. If I had to sit in the floor with my legs crossed to be saved, I couldn't do it. I told, I told Donna today, we, I was in the back, back porch with the little grandson Y'all, this sounds off color, but you, everybody has to do this. So I got one foot up on a chair in front of me, and I'm trying to trim my toenails. And Donna walked out and looked at me kind of funny, and I said, At my age, it's hard to get to your feet. <laughs> Who has trouble getting to your feet now? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> mm. <laughs> 
I don't know, why, I don't know where that come from. But uh, <laughs> says, uh, when I remember you on my bed and when I meditate, there's a great truth in meditation in the Lord. Here's what it means in the Hebrew. Listen to me. He says, when I meditate, this, this is something that you learn to do. It doesn't come natural. And you train yourself in this, and you benefit from it. I meditate upon the Lord. It says here in the Hebrew, I, I mutter to myself. I, talk, I, I mutter to myself. You ever heard anybody mutter and just walk around and talk about Mutter to myself. He says, I speak or whisper to myself. Why can't we learn to just whisper in our own private time? Just whisper scripture to ourselves. Whisper the scripture. I, I, I remember meditate. Well, I need to go on. That's not all the definition. Let me finish this. And it says here, it says here to mutter means to, to, to uh, meditate means to mutter to yourself, whisper to yourself. And then it says to muse. Interesting word to muse. Uh, uh, Musing is what a cow does. How many know that a cow has five stomachs? And if you watch a cow, we got one or two across the road from me. We got a cow, we got a horse, we got goats, we got chickens. Not me and Donna, but the lady right in front of my house, there's a field. And so we like to go over and look at the horses and cows and stuff. A cow will muse. Here's what David's saying. Here's what a cow does. A cow eats a big old mouthful of grass, puts it down in his first stomach, comes back up, and he chews and gets some more nutrients from it that he didn't get the first time, goes down into his second stomach, comes back up, and he chews it again and gets the rest. Okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's when you see that cow with that stuff hanging down on his face, you know, and he looks at you in the wind shaking it and all that kind of stuff. He's musing. He takes it down. He comes back up and he chews on it. The point is, he's getting everything out of it that he can get. He don't just read a verse of Scripture and move on. I remember when I, a verse of Scripture that really saved me during my sickness was that Psalm 103. And in particular where it said, He hath forgiven all my iniquities and he's healed all my diseases. Because in my case, the devil was telling me that the disease that was about to take my life was self-inflicted, which it was through the use of, I mean, let's be honest, from needles and drugs and stuff. And so the devil was telling me, how can you expect God to heal you? You did that. Look what you caused. You guilty. And I was guilty. And I caused that. And I was dying from it. But I started muttering that to myself. But wait a minute. He has forgiven me of my iniquities. He... And then when I got down, he's forgiven me of my iniquities. And I understood that's not held against me anymore. Then I understood, and he's healed me of all my disease. It didn't matter if my disease come from my iniquity or not. God had, had forgiven me of my iniquities, and God had healed me of my disease. And, and I remember laying in a hospital bed, and I was musing that thing. I would lay there for extended lengths of time for that one verse of Scripture and just think about it. Just get it, get it all down inside of me. I'm forgiven, and I'm healed. I'm forgiven and I'm healed. David said, I'm going to lay on my bed and I'm going to whisper to myself and I'm going to amuse. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything that I can ask or dream. God is. Ain't no God like our God. And since He is God and the only God, God is able. I know God can do this. And since He is God and He's the only God, God is able and God is able to do Above all I can ask or think. My God is not only the God, my God is not only able, but He's going to do more than I'm able to even ask Him about. Muse that thing. He hath delivered us from the powers of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. I might not feel like I'm saved today, and hell's hound dogs might be barking on my heels, but they don't have no right to be in my life because He delivered me from the power of darkness. I might be hearing it bark at me, but I'm delivered from it. And I might not feel like I'm saved, but I'm translated into the kingdom of God. I'm trying to show you, take one verse of Scripture and muse that thing over and over, and look at it this way, and look at it this way, and flip it over look at it this way look at it coming look at it going look at it every way you get everything you get in it out of it go in and dig up the original meaning of some words and 
compare it to other scriptures. Just squeeze that lemon till you get every bit of juice in it out. That's what David was saying. He's, he's, he's in this place hiding from Saul. And he said, you know what? I'm going to reflect on you. And in the middle of the night, I'm going to meditate on who you are, God. I'm going to squeeze everything out of your word. Then he said in verse 7, because you have been my help. He goes back to that thing of, I'm in trouble right now, but I sure know what you've already done for me. Because you have been my help, therefore, and I love this, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. In the shadow of his wings means to get up under him. We talked about the hen and the wings and how she gathered the flock together. He said, in the shadow of your wings, I'm musing on you, I'm praising you, I'm worshiping you, and I'm up in your presence, and in that presence I'm going to rejoice because I know that no weapon formed against me can get through this anointing. Because you've been my help. Therefore, in the share of your wings, I will rejoice. Watch this. This last verse is tremendous. I'm going to talk to you about verse 8. So far, we've seen that David said, said I, I want to get, I, I, I remember in church. I remember your power. I remember your majesty. I have felt it, seen it, and experienced it, and I've stood in amazement at it. And I'm meditating on you. I'm reflecting on you. I, I, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to get up under your covering. And then he says this. My soul followeth hard after you. Of course, that means I'm going to pursue, and I'm going to overtake, and I'm going to get the victory. But, but listen, listen to this. I found this just today. This is, this is one connotation of my soul followeth hard after you. It's, it's, it's the pursuit and the overtaking. It's a word picture of a male lion or a female lion as they hunt down their prey. Have you ever seen on a documentary, this is actually what he's saying. He said, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. You ever seen on a documentary, maybe a lion is overtaking a zebra or something, and they're eating it, and there's three or four of them laying on that zebra eating it, and they've got the victory, and they've got their spoil. And have you ever noticed that lions make a little weird noise when they're in victory? They'll be on that animal that they're overtaking, and they'll just be kind of, it's a real deep roar. You know, what they're saying is we are the king of the jungle and we take what we want. David said, I'm hard after you, God. What he said was in verse 8, after all that stuff about I'm going to muse on you, I'm going to meditate on you, I'm going to, I long to see you. Then he said in verse 8, my soul is going to follow hard after you. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm like that lion. I got the ability. I'm going to chase down every enemy I have to chase down. I'll gnaw it to death, and not just like a big old lion. I got a growl of victory on the inside of me. Praise God. We need to get back to the place. Instead of running from a devil, we live with a growl of victory on the inside of us. Hey! A growl of victory on the inside of us. That's who we need to be. Amen. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And that's the story behind the song tonight. David had some good stuff, didn't he? Hey, you know, totally off subject. Have y'all seen? I, I get. Has anybody else here seen this? I get. I'm on uh, some web, neighborhood website. Who's on that neighborhood watch website thing? Did y'all see where that big hundred pound? They're not sure what it is. Hundred pound panther cat thing is running loose around around Piedmont, and Powdersville, and. Williamson area. Nobody's seen it but me. It was on the day. They got pictures of it. You know, these cams that take pictures. If I hear him growl, I'm not going to act bold at all. <laughs> I'm going to squeal like a little girl getting in the house or something. How about that? Well, you would think stuff like that's around here. Hey, the road I live on just a few months back, somebody stuck on that website, a um, you know, one of them nighttime camera things that hangs on a tree, whatever it is. And it was a bear about a half mile down the street from me. I don't go out at night. <laughs> Y'all don't be surprised. They have found bears over here in Easley before. Y'all know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
I, Don and I, for eight or nine years, lived over here at Middle Creek, the Southern Division Middle Creek. And one night a bear came through there. It, it was trash night when everybody had the trash cans set out. And he knocked over about half the trash cans looking for food. That's when I decided to move. I'm getting out of here. This bear is knocking over trash cans. Hallelujah. David was in the middle of a storm, and he had the victory. Listen to yourself. Check yourself. See what comes up out of you when, you when you've been done wrong like David was done wrong in his story. See what comes up out of you when you feel like God's let you down. Because he had to feel like God let him down. Because God told him to go in. Then he got in trouble because he went in. See what comes up out of you. And, 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 and if the right thing ain't coming up out of you, take control of yourself. And say, I'm going to get my mouth right. I'm going to get my attitude right. Amen, everybody.